Thank you very much, Sally, and hello and welcome to everyone for our Animal Welfare Plenary. So welcome to the Animal Welfare Plenary. Uh, we're very excited to have a plenary here at EASA 2020, and it will be on the topic of welfare assessments. So just a reminder of all the talks that you will hear during this plenary session. Um, I'm Dr Holly Farmer. I'll be introducing the work of the Animal Welfare Working Group. Then we have a talk on the fundamentals of animal welfare assessments, a talk on how to apply animal welfare assessments in different contexts within your zoological institution, a quality of life assessments, the role of animal welfare assessments to support the pillars of the modern zoo, how to implement welfare assessments during staff training and culture, and finally, a step-by-step -step guide uh, to get started in using animal welfare assessments within a programme in your collection. So firstly, I'd like to give you an update on the work of the Animal Welfare Working Group over the last year. So just a reminder for those of you who maybe don't know much about our group, our aim is to support and advise EASA ex situ programmes, tax on advisory groups, and other EASA committees and working groups in animal welfare best practice. And we do this through applied evidence-based animal welfare science to promote positive animal welfare throughout all EASA institutions. And here's just an update of the working group members. So we have two vice chairs. These are Lisa Holmes and Graham Dick. We have Annette Pedersen from Copenhagen Zoo, um, Dana Canari from the Romanian Zoos and Aquariums Federation, Lisa Clifford from ZSL London and Whipsnaid, Hannah Meyer Latinen from Helsinki Zoo, Katerina Spitzio from Parco Natura Viva, Thomas Bionda from Appenhill Primate Park, and Claudia Tay from Wildlife Reserve Singapore. And we're also very lucky to have a number of official advisors. These are people, the majority of which work within an academic institution, but are there to give us a great amount of support in the work that we do, and also advice on different topics that we work on. And we also have an EASA Executive Office Liaison, who is Sally Binding, who was the EASA Animal Welfare Coordinator. And I'd just like to thank Sally particularly, I've just come off furlough from the last six and a half months. So thank you to Sally for organizing this plenary for us. You've got some amazing speakers and thank you for all the work that you've been doing while I've been away. You've really pushed everything forwards and I'm really excited about the plenary today. So I'd just like to talk a bit about some of the work that we've been doing. And the first thing we've been doing is working on compiling an animal welfare assessment library. And this is a provision of a collection of previously established animal welfare assessments and auditing tools. And thank you very much to all the people on the logos along the right hand side of your screen for allowing us to uh, publicise the information that they've been using for welfare assessments in their collections. And I'm very happy to say that all of this information is actually publicly accessible and open to everyone. So you can go on our website and download the welfare assessments that they use. Now, all of the welfare assessments have a slightly different approach to welfare monitoring, which we think will really provide the opportunity for collections to really align the type of animal welfare assessments they use for their organisational needs. And to make it a little bit easier, we've also provided a decision making tool and it's been provided for the full library to support members in selecting the most appropriate assessment for the needs of their collection. We've also translated one of our animal welfare assessments. We've used the Wild Planet Trust welfare assessment where I work, and we've so far translated it into 17 different languages. And this is a fantastic resource for anyone globally around the world to be able to start using assessments that we've provided. So thank you very much to everyone who's contributed to those translations. And just a little highlight, these are all the people that have, that have, um, have contributed to that. So thank you very much to everybody. And if you don't see your language on there and you would like to help out, please contact Sally at the executive office and we'd love to work with you. Thank you very much. We also have a lot of information for those EASA members that might be joining us today on the SharePoint. So if you'd like to go there, you can find not just the welfare assessments that are publicly available, but also some additional ones. And there's a great amount of additional resources for EASA members. So please go and check them out on our website. 
One of the newer aims for our welfare group is to work with the tax on advisory groups of EASA. And we'd like to work alongside the tags um, and have a tag liaison on the welfare group. And we have lots of different aims for this. So that's to just facilitate good communication between our working group and the tags. To also provide a feedback system to raise concerns in animals of areas of animal welfare that the tag might want to highlight. To ensure that the tax on advisory groups are well represented in any animal welfare discussions. And also to encourage the inclusion of animal welfare topics that are evidence based within best practice guidelines. And so these are all the tags that we can currently have a liaison with. So if you see your tag up there, fantastic, well done. If you don't see your tag up there and you'd like to get involved, please contact your tag chair or vice chair and please contact Sally through the EASA office because it would be great if we can get everybody involved. And we're also working with the EASA research committee to try and join our efforts in how we can really make these tag liaisons a really beneficial part of our working groups. Now, obviously, lots of things have had to be postponed this year, and very unfortunately for us, the Animal Welfare Forum that we, just, we were planning, which was the first Animal Welfare Forum to be um, conducted by EASA, had to be cancelled earlier this year. However, we're very excited to announce that you can now save the date in your calendars, and between the 22nd and the 24th of March 2022, we'll be hosting the first Animal Welfare Forum for EASA. And it will still be at Appen Hall Primate Park in the Netherlands. And thank you very much for Appen Hall for all the hard work you've put into this so far. And we're really looking forward to working with you in the future. And as an additional bonus, the day before the conference, we'll be running an EASA Academy course on a related topic. So um, numbers will be limited to that. So obviously, when registration comes out, that's something to look for. Now, in response to the plenary, and it's been a very popular plenary, as Sally said, we've had almost 800 people registered to hear all the exciting uh, work we're going to be talking about on animal welfare assessments. Sally had the wonderful idea of setting up a webinar seminar, a webinar series um, from on the back of this plenary session. So the aim of the webinar series is that we will discuss animal welfare assessments in much more detail. So there will be extended versions of the talks that you will hear today. So instead of 15 minutes, there'll be 45 minutes with a 15 minute question and answer session. And the recordings will be made publicly available via the ERs and YouTube channel. However, you will need to register as places will be limited. So the sign up will be via the ERs Animal Welfare Facebook page and the ERs website, and they'll be released on a monthly basis. And just to whet your appetite, here are the talks that you'll be able to hear. And so the first talk will be on the 27th of October. So keep your eyes out for registration coming up for that. And we hope you can join us with those as well and learn more about animal welfare assessments. Now, just a, an introduction to why we thought animal welfare assessments in zoos was a really important topic to cover in our plenary. Well, they're very important because they are a modern zoo priority, as you will hear later on within the plenary talks. And we really try and ensure best possible welfare of all the animals in our care in our institutions. It also makes us think more about using evidence based um, practice when we're using information and scientific, scientific information to actually make management decisions. And also, hopefully, that information that we can gain from our welfare audits can also lead into best practice guidelines for those animals that are managed on a European level. So to get started, I'm very excited to announce our first speaker of the plenary session. So I will um, ask Xavier, please, if he could share his screen. I will unshare mine. There we go. And I'd like to introduce Xavier Manteca Villanova, who is a professor at the School of Veterinary Science at the University of Barcelona. And Xavier will be talking about the fundamentals of welfare assessments. So to try and make it a little bit more approachable for collections, a bit more understandable as to why we might use them, and also how can we decide which kind of assessment to use depending on your collection needs. So thank you very much, Xavier. I'll now turn off my screen and my, my sound and you can start talking. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Holly, for the introduction and hello, everyone. Before I get started, I would like to thank the organizing committee and particularly uh, Sally and, and Holly for inviting me to deliver this uh, webinar on the fundamentals of welfare assessment. I think that
I have a problem just to pass on the slides. Okay, sorry, here we go. Um, we, we know why welfare assessment is, is important and Holly has mentioned that. We need welfare assessment uh, protocols to identify problems and also to monitor progress when improvement strategies are being implemented. And I guess that we also agree uh, as well that uh, animal welfare assessment tools should be based on science rather than on opinion or personal impressions. Now, following on from this, what I would like to do over the next 15 minutes or so is to share with you several ideas which have been quite useful to me when planning and executing welfare audits in, in a number of different uh, institutions. And I uh, like uh, to do that following this plan. I will start uh, looking at this issue of how to set priorities. Then I like to discuss what should we measure when doing a welfare audit. And finally, how should we measure it? Now, uh, getting started with the first part of my talk, uh, setting uh, priorities. Now, I think when we want to, to assess welfare, uh, we want to do it uh, because of an ethical concern, and that is to me of uh, paramount importance, is the main thing. We may also want to do it uh, because of the link between welfare and conservation and education programs, and perhaps as well in some cases because of public perception. But again, to me, the key issue is a, is a moral and ethical one. And that uh, comes from the fact that uh, animals are sentient beings. And it turns out that all vertebrates and some invertebrates as well are sentient. So, uh, Ideally, our welfare audit should cover all vertebrate and some invertebrate species in our collection. However, it is also true that resources are very often limited and perhaps in some cases that will not be possible or even if it is possible, we have to set priorities in terms of who comes first. Now, what I am suggesting is when setting priorities, we have to do it at two different levels, the species level and the individual level. So as for the uh, species level, I think the uh, key idea is that now we have good evidence that some species have more difficulties than others to cope with the uh, zoo environment. And these differences may be found also between very closely related species. You have two lemurs here, the ring tail lemur, which seems to cope quite well with the zoo environment in general, and the injury, which is a lemur as well, but is very difficult uh, to, to be kept uh, in, in zoos and in captivity in general uh, uh, properly. So uh, similar species, if you want, at least from a taxonomic point of view, very different in their response to captivity. And we have some evidence as to why that is the case, at least for some taxonomic groups. And this slide tries to summarize that with three uh, studies on, on, on three different taxonomic groups, carnivores, ruminants, and, and parrots. And uh, as you can see, the uh, natural history traits that explain differences in uh, the uh, business with which uh, species cope with captivity, the natural history traits are different uh, vary across groups. For example, in, in carnivores, it is basically the, uh, the, the distance they, they range uh, in the wild. In ruminants, diets seem to be quite important and browsing ruminants seem to be more difficult than grazing ones. And in parrots, there is a, a, a range of, of different natural history traits that explain uh, those uh, differences in the ability to cope with, uh, with the zoo environment. Uh, so my, my first suggestion is that when you have a variety of species, think as to whether some of them fall uh, into this uh, categories of uh, difficult species because they uh, range uh, long distances in the wild or they are browsing ruminants or, or whatever, and consider that when setting your priorities, that the species, species level approach. 
But to me, probably more important than that is the fact that the uh, welfare, uh, the concept of animal welfare is something that applies to individual animals. So when setting priorities, it is okay to think about the species, but it is even more important to think about individuals. And here I have put a list of uh, five um, criteria you may want to consider when setting your priorities in the collection. Uh, so geriatric animals to me uh, should be a priority because uh, geriatric animals are always in a difficult situation in terms of welfare because of diseases, uh, because of changes in the social structure and so on. Animal with chronic or recurrent diseases, so uh, that's important for two reasons. One is that poor welfare, stress, uh, chronic stress may increase susceptibility to disease and also also because disease itself uh, is a welfare issue. So if you have animals with those sort of problems, they, they should be in your priority list. Uh, the same applies to animals with other signs of presumably poor welfare. So um, abnormal behaviors, poor body condition or whatever. Then you have uh, the, the issue of temperament or personality of animals. That's very important to me. And you may have animals which are, for example, very fearful and that may suggest that they will have more difficulties to cope with the zoo environment. And finally, you have the facilities. If you have presumably poor facilities, count that in uh, when uh, producing your list of, of priorities. And that, uh, that uh, is one uh, of the reasons why when uh, planning uh, an audit at the very beginning, when you are setting your priorities, you have to talk with a number of people. You have to talk with the veterinarians, I mean, think about diseases. And of course, you have to talk with the curators and the keepers, because they are the ones who know their animals the best, and they may identify animals with a difficult uh, temperament, with uh, other signs of poor welfare and so on. So make it a teamwork to set your priorities and don't think only about species which are supposed to be more difficult. Think about the species, yes, based on evidence, but mainly think about individuals and perhaps these ideas here may, may guide you in that uh, setting of priorities. Right, so uh, the second part of my talk is once we have our uh, list of priorities, or I mean, uh, we know how uh, we are going to tackle these, which species and, and, and what order, then the next question is what should we measure? And here I like to share two ideas with you. One is probably uh, something uh, very familiar to you, but, but still uh, worth uh, insisting on. And that is the fact that uh, animal welfare, no matter how we choose to define it, and, and this is not the right place to start a long discussion on the definition of animal welfare, it doesn't really matter, but uh, no matter how we define it, how we phrase it, we all agree that animal welfare includes uh, different things that have to be uh, measured and looked at when trying to assess welfare. And these different things have been phrased in a nice way, for example, by, by Mellor in these four uh, domains that appear uh, the upper part of the slide, nutrition, environment, health, and behavior. And the idea is that from each of these four domains, um, a number of uh, negative or positive affective states may derive, and uh, the sum of all these positive and negative uh, affective states uh, makes up the mental state of the animal, which equals to welfare. But the take home message from this slide is that when you are assessing welfare, you are not looking at behavior only, you are not looking at health only, you are not looking only at the facilities. You have to look at behavior, health, the environment and nutrition. And of course, this is just a way of putting it. There are other ways of classifying these different domains or aspects or elements of animal welfare. So for example, the Wild Planet Trust audit, which is extremely useful, have a slightly different approach in one of the, of the uh, sections, but basically at the end of the day, the message is this. Consider and remember that welfare includes different things, that's behavior, health, environment, nutrition, and of course, all the uh, stressors that may impinge upon the animal. Now, the second idea in this part of my talk is that uh, we have to remember that welfare may vary across time. Uh, we may have a seasonal effect, 
uh, for several reasons. For example, because some welfare problems uh, may depend on climatic conditions. So I come from a country with extremely hot summers and uh, some welfare issues are not equivalent in summer as they are in winter. Uh, animals may change their behavior seasonally and that may have an impact on their welfare as well. Social interactions may change due to reproduction and so on. It's not only seasonal throughout the year, uh, that we have an effect. Uh, time of day is also important. Again, climatic conditions may vary and uh, animals may change their behavior um, as the day uh, goes, uh, goes on. So uh, remember that it is not just a matter of looking at welfare uh, today at one time uh, in, in summer or in the fall. You have to look at different seasons, different times of the day. And the other thing, of course, is that uh, you have very often uh, two, uh, two types of facilities, the outdoor facilities or the facilities which are accessible to public. Uh, some countries, for example, mainly outdoor, whereas indoor facilities are not that accessible to the public, uh, but animals still spend a lot of time in those facilities. Remember that you, you need to include uh, all facilities where the animals spend time in your welfare audit, not just those which are accessible to the public. And uh, in our experience, very often, some of the main welfare problems are found in facilities which are not accessible to the public. Okay, so that brings me to the uh, third and last section of my talk. So we have got our priorities, remember species and individual level. We uh, have discussed two aspects of what we should measure. Remember the multidimensional nature of animal welfare, health, behavior, nutrition, and so on, and changes during time and between indoor and outdoor facilities. So how we measure? animal welfare. Now, the key word here is uh, indicators. We need indicators of, of welfare. And um, here you, you have three, uh, three ideas, which uh, to me are useful, as I said at the beginning, uh, because animal welfare is multidimensional. There is no indicator which on its own may provide all the relevant information. So you have to use several indicators and that is not enough. You have to use uh, a range of indicators that cover the different aspects of welfare. So nutrition, health, behavior and so on. Uh, sometimes we have indicators which are very good at providing information about one domain, but we need to complement that with indicators that cover the other domains. Now, the second idea is that uh, remember that as it happens in any branch of science, uh, nothing is it's perfect, no, no, no indicator, no test is perfect. We always have uh, validity and methodological issues which uh, do not render an indicator invalid, but uh, we have to take them into account to interpret the information we get. And finally, we have to find a balance between different types of indicators. And with this, I mean, if you are familiar with the animal welfare science jargon, the balance between resource-based and animal-based indicators. I am sure you are familiar with this, animal-based, you look at the animal, behavior, body condition, health, uh, resource-based, you look at the facilities, the enclosure, the diet, and so on. And uh, the current consensus among welfare scientists is that whenever possible, you have to prioritize animal-based indicators. And that is because resource-based indicators are based on the assumption that a given environmental feature has a predictable, and that is the key word, predictable effect on welfare. However, this is not necessarily true because uh, there are a number of interactions between environmental features and also because animals vary in their response to environmental features within a given species and even uh, within the same sex and age class due to temperament and personality. And because environmental features do not have this predictable effect on welfare, we uh, favor whenever possible animal-based indicators. Uh, for example, behavior, body condition, appearance and clinical signs, vet records, qualitative behavioral assessment, and in some cases, physiological measures. Now, having said this, however, I would like to go one step back and suggest that uh, there is no point uh, to completely forget about resource-based indicators. I entirely agree with the idea that animal-based indicators are the most 
useful and the most important, but sometimes resource-based indicators are also useful. And remember my previous slide, I said resource-based indicators do not necessarily reflect the welfare status of the animals, but that doesn't mean that they never reflect the welfare status of the animals. So there are some resource-based indicators which are easy to measure and that still provide useful information. So avoid extremes and, and try to find a good balance giving priority, yes, to animal-based, but without forgetting resource-based. Now, when you select your indicators, and that is my second last uh, idea, uh, one thing which I believe is extremely important is that you have to do an effort to learn about the natural history of the species you are auditing. And that is important to identify possible problem areas and to select the best indicators. So learn about the behavior and the biology of the species when preparing your audit and selecting your indicators. Things such as the geographical range and habitat, the diet, use of space and time budget, foraging behavior and social behavior are among some of the main aspects of the natural history of the species you would like to gather as much information as, as possible. Just to illustrate these two studies you may be familiar familiar with the welfare of clouded leopards. Uh, the authors look at the behavior and physiological measures and identified um, some aspects of the environment which had an impact on the welfare of the animals, uh, the, uh, whether potential predators were visible, possibility to climb an absence of public or possibility to hide from the public. Those things were important for the welfare of the clouded leopards. And this second study, looking at demand experiments with mink, uh, and, and the authors rank three resources as being very important, water pool, then second to that, having an alternative nest site, and finally a race platform. So why do I show you these two studies? Well, because if you reflect on the results, they fit very well with the natural history of the species. The clouded leopard spend a lot of time in the arboreal stratum, and they, they, they are hunters, but they, they are prey as well, and they are shy animals, and mink are semi-aquatic, and they have different nest sites in their natural environment. So if you learn about the species, then you can gather a lot of information, which is gonna be useful when identifying possible problems in the facilities and when selecting your indicators, either resource or animal-based indicators. And finally, my last idea. I think that one fundamental aspect of a good welfare audit, as almost everything else in life, is uh, teamwork. You have to work with vets, curators, and, and, and keepers. I said that before. And I believe keepers are extremely important because they, they are the ones that uh, know their animals that, best and they can provide information for example in form of keepers uh, ratings uh, an overall holistic assessment of animal uh, welfare which has been shown to correlate very well with traditional measures and which are uh, based on previous experiences in farm animals what we call qualitative behavioral assessment that is just one way that keepers can provide information it's just an example of a uh, um, writing using qualitative behavioral assessment where the observer uh, gives an score on each of these uh, descriptors for, for, for each of the individual animals and, and this has been proved to be extremely useful uh, was developed for farm animals and can be applied to, to zoo animals as well. So just to uh, sum up uh, very briefly, uh, remember teamwork, set priorities thinking about individuals, not only a species, prioritize animal-based, but don't forget about resource-based, try to cover the four domains of welfare, however you, you choose to phrase them, and, uh, and then learn about the natural history of the, of the species, both to identify possible problems and to select the best indicators. And with this, once again, thank you very much to IASA for inviting me, and thank you very much to all of you for, for listening. Bye-bye now. Thank you very much for a wonderful talk on the fundamentals of animal welfare assessments. It's a great start to our plenary. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'd now like to introduce Claudia Tay. Claudia, would you like to share your screen, please? Hello. So Hello. Claudia is the Animal Welfare Officer for the Department of Zoology and Animal Welfare and the Animal Welfare Representative for Wildlife Reserve Singapore. And she's going to talk about applying animal welfare assessments in different contexts, so things like events, enclosure moves and collection planning. So thank you very much, Claudia.
All right, uh, good evening everyone, or well, it might be afternoon for some of you all. So my name is Claudia and I'm from Wildlife Reserve Singapore. So today I'll be talking about applying animal welfare assessments to different contexts. So you may wonder, I know you could hear a lot about the typical animal welfare or the risk assessments. And typically the assessments are talking uh, more on many aspects of animal welfare. So that may include environment. So that will be where, you know, they may look at the living spaces of the animal. Did we provide um, in, uh, sufficient space? You know, did we provide any uh, appropriate furniture? You know, we might also look at the health of the animal, right? So that would be including, you know, uh, do we have any um, uh, programs, you know, any surveillance programs, as in vaccination programs, or we might even look at behavior of the animal. Do they actually show behavioral uh, diversity? or may they also show um, their natural behavior. And, and then that could also be on nutrition. So that could be, you know, um, are the animals uh, being provided uh, the species specific diet or even individually specific diet. And of course, there's also husbandry. So that may include uh, things like, you know, does the husbandry timing coincides with their natural rhythmic timing. Right, and also one assessment that's becoming quite popular, right, is actually the quality of life assessment. So that actually focuses more on the animal's quality of life, and potentially it could be used as an objective euthanasia decision tool. But how about other assessments, right? What if you have more event-based assessments? So for example, you want to move an animal from one enclosure to another, or a group of animals or if you want to introduce animals that have previously not been together, it was for social animals, for example. Or how about if you actually have, a, you have your collection planning and you want to know if your animal or the animals before you bring them in, you know, are they actually suitable uh, in your facility, right? So there are a lot of other ways you could actually do these assessments for. So today, what I'm actually going to go through are these planning steps. So because I only have 15 minutes, I cannot go in much detail, but please feel free to contact me you know, uh, separately about this. Right? And of course, you don't have to follow all this. It's just like a guideline. So for the first one, you actually have to determine the objectivity, uh, your objectives, right? So firstly, what is your assessment used for? So for example, if you want to have a collection planning, right? you need to know, all right, um, why do you want to do it? What is what's the aim that you want to achieve at the end of the day, right? So all these things are very important because this sets up your assessment um, for the future and you actually get to see that, you know, this is really important and key. And the next thing that you actually have to consider is actually setting up a working group. So after establishing the objective, you kind of know what you want, um, what the objective is, you actually have to identify who will be instrumental in formulating this assessment. Right? And one key thing, which I know is really difficult, is that these people should be able to commit time for the entire process. And I definitely identify with how difficult it can be. You know, we have people who are both in the field, you know, and they have office work or lots of meetings, you know, we all definitely suffer from that. But the reason why you need this kind of commitment is because this is something that you will need to um, spend a lot of time on and it would make sense to have a core group of people, right? And also another thing that's not there is the number of people. So you could have a huge group, a very small group. And I would have to say that there are pros and cons, right? We have two little people, maybe you will have not enough perspective. But if you have too many people, then you may have a lot and a lot of opinions, which is fine. But I have to say from my experience, um, I, we I ever had one where we had a really huge group of about 15, 15 people. And we ended up taking like an hour and a half for one question, just to discuss one question. So it may not be the best idea to have way too many people in your working group as well. Right? And oh, okay. All right, so for the introduction of the animals, for example, you need to consider, you know, staff who directly look after the animals, uh, curator, because they can come in with a different perspective, a management perspective. And for the vets, they will consider other views that, you know, it would be really useful as well. So to get a different perspective is the very important part as well in setting up you know, your working group. Right, next, you need to decide on the indicators. So that's where you'll be looking at 
resource-based versus animal-based indicators. Right? As the previous speaker has really uh, done a good job explaining what these two are, so it's really important. And the thing is, you don't have to choose one or the other. You could have both uh, in the same assessment. Uh, and, and that's a good thing. You don't have to limit yourself to only having one. And you can also consider the indicators grouping them in physical states. So you recognize, of course, um, environment, behavior, nutrition, health, all these are part of um, Mellis uh, five domain model. We also can look at the affective state, right? So that's when you may look at more animal-based indicators, right? And you may also consider other things. And biomarkers is one other thing. You may look at cortisol level of the animals um, and other physiological you know, um, indicators. So there's quite a range of it. And you have to, as I said, go back again to the objective and decide what is appropriate for your assessment. Next, we actually have to consider the scoring system. So this might seem like a small thing, right? It's like, okay, we could just have yes, no, not applicable. Uh, or how about a scale? But it can get a little bit more complicated. So even for the scale, it could be like, what sort of scale do you want? Right? Do you want zero to two, you know, zero to five? Um, you might want a little bit more of a sensitive scale, so you might go for a larger number. And also, if you have a scoring system using numbers, you have to decide then, for example, what is positive welfare or what is negative, what's neutral. So there are a lot of considerations that you have to take into account when you are setting up your assessment. Next, you have to review existing animal welfare assessments. So the very important thing to note is you do not need to start from scratch. And I think that's quite a big thing, right? Because before you set up an animal welfare assessment, it may be very intimidating. The thought of having to do this, you know, depending on your assessment, it could be 30 questions, it could be 10, but it may be very intimidating. But the thing is, there are a lot of resources out there. So use the resources available. So that could include, you know, looking at assessment library. So just now Holly talked about the IAZA and Mobile Welfare Assessment Library. You could start there. So you may not need to use the exact same one, but you could tailor what they have to your institution, right? You also could look at scientific papers, Google Scholar. There's a lot of resources out there. You know, so if you're looking at animal transfers, you could just type animal transfers assessment and Hopefully something pops up and that could be useful. And also don't forget general searches because sometimes, you know, official documents, sorry, keep saying that, <laughs> uh, official documents or protocols um, could just be in the general search function. Next, creating a prototype. So after consolidating the available resources, you can create your prototype. But of course, do go through a few rounds of feedback and that also includes asking other people who are not part of the core working group for their opinion. So after you all come up with, say, 20 questions that you feel are appropriate for your assessment, that's when you could ask other people who are not part of the core working group for their feedback. And next, for step seven, it is time to trial the prototype. So this is really important. Try, try, and try. I can't emphasize that enough. Um, because that actually helps you perceive it from the user point of view. And you don't just have to do it yourself as the core working group. You could get other people to try it as well. And then they could highlight the problems or what works really well for them, what doesn't work, uh, what you can consider. And the thing is, sometimes, you know, after you set it up, you think, all right, this looks good. You know, the call groups like, all right, this is great. And then you realize it doesn't quite work. Or some people may not understand the question as well as you thought they would. Yeah. So all these are very important things that can be highlighted during your trial of the prototype. Right, next, editing the prototype. So after receiving all the feedback from the different groups, it's time to come back together and discuss the problems. Um, what can be done better? What can we change? Uh, it could be big things like, oh, we need to change the scale, or it could just be a wording issue that you can just edit and get that over and done with. So it really depends um, on the feedback you receive. Right, and feedback from people who actually have to use it is definitely the best because they will be the people who are using it very often and them understanding it and you know, kind of having that buy-in is really important to setting up this assessment. And next, your assessment is born. So what's very important is, of course, that you have to start using it, which is great. 
But one difficulty, and I think that later Sally will be talking about this as well, is about training staff to use the assessment. So from my experience, it is very essential. You know, it might be difficult at the beginning because you need to find the time to train people in it. But because it's something new to them, they may not use it as best as they can. Whereas if you train them to do it, that's uh, really essential and that could actually help facilitate the whole assessment process. So for example, someone um, in, in WRS, and I think he's one of the participants, I'm not gonna name him. <laughs> so for him, uh, when he first did the assessment, he actually only considered the exhibit as part of his assessment. I mean, not his fault, but because he didn't go through the training yet, he didn't realize that he was sort of considered the back of house. Right? Whereas if he had gone for the training, he would have realized, okay, this is what I have to consider. So, you know, in that sense where it, could have, it would be easier, of course, if the staff are trained. And sometimes you might even need to retrain the staff, but that's future problems, right? Uh, validation. So this is really important because sometimes staff may not realize that um, they may score things a little bit differently from how it should be done. So it could be things like, for example, in Singapore, our weather is pretty consistent. So sometimes people might put, oh, like the temperature part of the assessment, they might be like, oh, that's not applicable because our weather is pretty much the same throughout. You know, we don't have winter, it's pretty much just summer throughout. But it's actually applicable because temperature range and, and all that kind of things are actually really important to the animal, right? So that's where validation is really important. And what you can do, especially if it's a scoring system, you can have your validation group and then you can also have the um, the keepers themselves, for example, if they are the ones doing assessment, you both do it separately, come back together and see how close the scores are. And if they're really similar, then you know, okay, you are thinking the same way. And if it's not, find out what's the reason and then that's where you can align your views. So these are all very important things. Right? Constantly reviewing the assessment. Uh, I have to say it's a bit unfortunate, but most of the time we don't get it right the first time. Like it may be great, but it's not perfect. So one good thing is after many people have done it, they could have feedback to change it. And that's when you need to revise it. You know, and you may have version one, two, three. But the important thing is that this assessment is constantly changing for the better and that it suits uh, every single person. Right, and thank you very much. Uh, I actually just want to thank Yaza for having me. Um, and also thank you uh, to WRS for supporting me. Yeah. And Thank you. Thank you very much, Claudia. Wonderful talk. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to pass on now to Heather Bacon. Heather, would you like to share your screen, please? So Heather is a veterinarian and she's the Vet Welfare and Outreach Manager for the Jeanne Marshig International Centre for Animal Welfare Education at the University of Edinburgh. And today, Heather is going to talk about quality of life assessments, so the importance of their use how and when to use them, and to also give some examples. So Heather, if you'd like to share, please. Thank you. Hi, uh, can everyone hear me okay? And hopefully see my screen. Great. Okay, um, I'd like to start just by thanking um, IAZA for coordinating this event, in particular um, Sally, who I know has put a lot of, of work into this. Um, and I'm going to be talking a little bit today about animal welfare assessments. So um, we've got quite a short time, but as has already been said by Holly, um, we will be doing longer versions of these talk at a later date to give you a bit more depth and detail and some more practical examples. So today we'll just be looking at what we mean by quality of life and how that may, or in some cases may not be different to animal welfare. We'll be looking at some of the welfare challenges that might be experienced by geriatric zoo animals and discuss um, animal welfare assessment in terms of euthanasia decision making and quality of life. So quality of life is an interesting concept. Quite often we use the term interchangeably um, with animal welfare or sometimes perhaps when we mean animal welfare. Um, quality of life is actually a, a human um, quality and um, 
it is defined by the World Health Organization as an individual's perception of their position in life in the context of the culture and value systems in which they live and in relation to their goals, expectations, standards and concerns. And if we consider this definition, we can see that applying that definition to non-human animals is actually really challenging because we don't know how animals perceive their position in a societal context. We don't know if all animals have culture and value systems. We don't necessarily know what their goals, expectations, standards and concerns are. And quality of life is usually a concept that is relative to all of those things. It's a very contextual um, sort of um, phenomenon. So it's really challenging to apply that human definition to non-human animals. And often when we are talking about quality of life assessment, most of the work that's been done has been done on non-human animals that are companion animals. And they're usually companion animals um, that are being rated, their quality of life is being rated by their owners and their owners' um, expectations of their animals' quality of life in relation to all of those things uh, that we've just talked about. Um, and they're often used uh, in animals that have significant pathology to make end of life decisions. Um, sorry, my slide is not moving on. And I don't know why. Mm -hmm. Um, oh, Have you tried uh, uh, the space bar? Or yeah, I've tried the space bar and the arrow keys. It moved on from the last time I used it because I'm on my my uh, my third slide in the the um in the presentation. So I'm not sure why it suddenly stopped moving. <sighs> Can you access the little arrows in the PowerPoint presentation rather than your keyboard, uh, maybe? And if I come out, okay, that's fine. Apologies for that, everyone. Technology is wonderful. Um, okay, so we've talked a little bit about quality of life. In terms of quality of life um, and animal welfare, what's the difference between sort of a quality of life assessment and an animal welfare assessment? To be honest, the answer is not really very much. It's usually about the context in which that assessment might be used. When we're looking at animal welfare assessments, we are evaluating the physiological and psychological health of an animal, how that individual animal is coping mentally and physically with their circumstances. So we are using what we call composite assessments, assessments um, or indicators that um, evaluate different aspects of the animal's physiology, different aspects of their psychological health. We put those together um, like a jigsaw puzzle to give us a big picture of how that animal is coping. And essentially we do the same thing with a quality of life assessment and we can often use our standard animal welfare assessments to evaluate quality of life as well. Um, I think we just need to be really clear about what it is we're talking about and this probably becomes even more complicated when we're looking at uh, different parts of the world, uh, different cultural interpretations of what we mean by quality of life and also different language translations. Really if we're talking about quality of life we would be looking at the animal's whole life experience. And that's really challenging in zoo animals, particularly ones that are long lived or the ones that have been transferred around between different collections and had lots of different experiences. Um, we also might not have enough information on things like specific life stage needs across different taxa to be able to evaluate that adequately to get that whole life picture. So generally, when we use the term quality of life assessment, we are in a similar way to the work that's been done in other domestic animals, usually looking at clinical assessments to aid end of life decision making. So quality of life is an interesting um, issue because it almost always has this context of making decisions about end of life. And because of that, 
I think there are often some concerns about quality of life assessments or even just welfare assessments in general. Because as has already been said by previous speakers, welfare assessments for geriatric animals are really, really important in order to ensure that we are safeguarding their welfare adequately. But sometimes, particularly if we're using this term of quality of life, that can be interpreted as the assessment being used only as a tool to make a decision about euthanizing that animal or ending its life and that can be emotionally quite challenging so um, making sure everyone is on board and there's a clear understanding of how different assessments might be used is really important so moving on to animal welfare in our geriatric zoo species aging really is a normal physiological process um, and the, the process of aging or senescence reduce, results in reduced function of all body systems and eventually it results in death. Old age is not a disease in itself but increasing age does predispose to pathological conditions and many of those pathological conditions can negatively impact upon animal welfare. So there are a number of different welfare challenges that animals may face as they age. Things like cognitive decline, so actual reduced cognitive function and brain function. Um, we can see dementia type syndromes in animals as they age, particularly in, in mammalian species. Sensory degeneration, skin and feather changes, coat changes. We might see a more uh, systemic illnesses such as cardiac disease, kidney disease or reproductive pathologies. And we see more painful conditions such as osteoarthritis or dental disease and these can have concurrent behavioral changes such as reduced physical strength, reduced activity or different types of activity. And so we might need to consider a variety of different medical and non-medical management techniques to safeguard the welfare of animals that are experiencing these multiple challenges. Managing geriatric animals to ensure good welfare can be really challenging because there are lots of different things that we need to consider to address those problems that we've just outlined. We might need to consider things like social grouping because of hierarchy changes or predisposition to bullying as animals age or get weaker. We might need to consider enclosure design and how animals can cope in their existing enclosures. Um, we might need to consider some of the husbandry practices that we engage in. So things like operant conditioning can be really useful for, for things like um, increased medical or husbandry management. But animals as they age can also find operant conditioning more challenging as their ability to learn and respond to cues may diminish. Similarly, enrichment provision that may need to be modified as an animal's sensory and cognitive abilities change to ensure that we're not getting animals that are frustrated or anxious about interacting with enrichment. We might notice changes in their activity budgets. We may need to consider different dietary strategies, different types of food, um, consider um, muscle mass and body condition um, in relation to dietary changes. We might need to consider the provision of pain management, including uh, both um, pharmacotherapeutic um, interventions, but also husbandry changes that can also be positive in terms of managing the pain experience. Cognitive support and, of course, veterinary care and medical management of any pre-existing systemic pathologies. So because of the multifactorial nature of the aging process and the often concurrent development of different problems and pathologies related to age, aging um, addressing the different welfare challenges that arise can require a significant investment of resources and time both in terms of identifying those problems and in, in terms of holistically managing them to ensure that all of those different things are addressed. So the first kind of step in, in doing that really is recognizing that these welfare problems may exist as animals age. And there are some barriers to doing that. And I know that there'll be a discussion later about training and training of staff is really important. As humans, all of us tend to be um, susceptible to what we call a status quo bias. And this is where we perceive things that occur frequently as being normal. So we might say that an animal, oh, he's always grumpy or she's always stereotyped or they're always stiff and slow. 
and we sort of normalize those kinds of problem indicators when in fact those problem indicators are exactly that and can be really useful in terms of our welfare assessment. So welfare assessment is really important because it's an objective tool to looking at that animal's welfare and ensuring that we don't accidentally overlook some of these subtle changes of welfare problems. If we can identify degenerative changes that occur with age and take management decisions to safeguard animal welfare, then we can um, ensure that our animals are receiving better treatment earlier on rather than waiting until they're showing more significant or severe signs of welfare problems before we do anything about it. Also, if we recognise the ageing process and how animals uh, health and welfare may be gradually deteriorating through the ageing process, we can start to plan ahead for difficult decisions around euthanasia. We can start to have those conversations within the management team. Um, we can start to um, you know, make plans to ensure that an animal's welfare is not compromised beyond a level with which we're comfortable. However, I would actually say to try and avoid welfare assessments being a quality of life assessment tool that only leads to euthanasia. Because I think if you only use these tools with old animals as a view to managing their euthanasia, then very often that can be quite discouraging for the keeping team to engage with that process. Ideally, welfare assessment should be a normal and objective assessment for all life stages and across many species. It should be a part of our routine record keeping to provide us with that valuable baseline information that we can then measure any changes or any degeneration against. So that objective welfare assessment is really important and it's even more important as our animals age because as we've said as humans we're not always reliable at picking up those subtle changes of degeneration and quite often we do have a, a tendency ourselves to normalize some of the problems that our animals might face and that's been shown in the research um, so this is, a, is quite an old study now, but um, still valid in that um, the physical condition and quality of life in, in large zoo animals was, was um, evaluated through uh, post-mortem records and, and assessments. And that showed that quite often the level of degeneration that these animals experienced was very advanced prior to euthanasia and that actually euthanasia could be delayed to the detriment of the animal's welfare in, in some cases. And so that regular objective assessment is really important in preventing situations like this from occurring. And it isn't just a problem in the zoo world. I think this is a problem in any situation where we have animals that we as human beings care about um, because dealing with death and planning for the death of that animal is an emotionally really challenging um, process to engage in. And some recent work that we did in the UK across a range of species showed that um, our domestic animals, including farm animals and companion animals, also um, experience similar challenges in terms of things like pain management, delayed euthanasia and chronic ill health as being priority welfare issues. So I think understanding the issues from a, a human point of view is also really important. Um, we have a lot of these tools now in terms of welfare assessment, we just need to, to start using them more frequently. Um, in terms of euthanasia, what we're talking about really is providing our animals with a good death. We're talking about the act that we're doing and not the justification for it. The decision making for doing that can be really challenging because of the different ethical perspectives and the different viewpoints and we'll talk more about that in a, a, at a later date. Um, but what we really want to be focusing on is that objective assessment of animal welfare because that allows us to make a more informed decision that is objective and isn't um, based on our, our cultural or personal viewpoints around euthanasia or around welfare um, for the animal. In terms of making difficult decisions for our geriatric animals, we know that it's often easier when there's a rapid decline in an animal's clinical condition um, and that zoo animal welfare can be um, 
uh, challenged due to delayed decision making around euthanasia and that often that's because of subjective opinions or emotional decisions or because we do have that human animal bond which whilst being very important for zoo animal welfare can sometimes also prevent us from being um, as objective as we need to be um, and so starting welfare assessments early when animals are young and healthy continuing them through the lifetime of that animal gives us that really objective data-driven evidence that this animal's behavior is changing its physical state is changing its welfare is changing and that makes that decision making much easier and much less stressful for staff working in zoos So just in summary, our geri geriatric animals may experience a variety of complex physical and psychological pathologies as they age. And managing those multiple health problems um, is really challenging. It requires a, a significant investment in time and resources. And even then, it may not always be successful and uh, that regular monitoring is required. And by using these objective tools and starting when animals are young and healthy, we can um, remove a lot of the stress um, and the, the emotional load that is associated with making decisions about euthanasia and quality of life at the end of life for um, staff within zoos. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Heather. And it's great to get some more clarification on how important it is to not only conduct welfare assessments, but to really try and do it throughout an animal's lifetime. I think that's brilliant to highlight that. Thank you very much for your talk. So next up is Thomas Bionda, who is the Zoological Manager at Appen Hill Primate Park in the Netherlands. So where we'll be holding our first EASA Welfare Forum. And he'll be talking about the role of animal welfare assessments in supporting progressive approaches to achieve the pillars of modern zoos. So over to you, Thomas. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Holly. Uh, hello, everyone. Thanks for having me here. I'd like to thank Sally and Holly in particular for this opportunity. And I think we already had some great talks about uh, how to do animal welfare assessments and also why, but then from an animal perspective. And I would like to talk also about the why, but then from a broader zoo perspective and how does animal welfare help us in reaching our goals and, and uh, all other stuff that we do at the zoo. Um, so before I start, I would like to talk about um, stuffed animals and not stuffed animals in general, but, but one in particular and uh, that's this one which hopefully will show up yeah and just to prove that it really exists it's not a google picture i have it right here um so there's a there's an interesting story behind this one uh, it's a one of a kind it's a, still a prototype and um my colleague uh, who is running the the souvenir shop in apple he asked one of his suppliers just to um, design a bonobo uh, because there are a lot of uh, chimp um, stuffed animals but no bonobos so in Apple, we only have bonobos and no chimpanzees. So, so the company said, well, we're gonna try and do it. And uh, they were up for the challenge. So this is the design they uh, came up with. Um, um, I appreciate that not all of you are primate enthusiasts like my colleagues at Apple and myself, but um, there is something wrong with this bonobo. And I'm not talking about this mountain gorilla fur or is the color of his hands or his web like more like a duck feet. Uh, but his face, the coloration of his face, so all bonobos, um, in contrast to chimpanzees, they are born with a black face. Um, so, uh, and there's something more. Um, so my, my colleague asked me, well, does this really look like a bonobo, do you think? So I, I told them about the face, so it's not, it's not really good, but they couldn't change it. But I also asked him, why, why do they have this weird bald spot um, um, on the top of his head? And he couldn't really explain it, so he asked the supplier and they said, well, we just Googled any pictures of bonobos and uh, yeah, they look like this. So I was a bit puzzled and I said, well, okay, I'm gonna try it myself as well. And if you Google, um, then this is what you see, at least if you have the same cookies as I do. Um, and what's really interesting um, is they were actually true. So if you can see, there are a lot of pictures here from uh, mainly zoo, uh, zoo house bonobos that have that same bald spot, um, which was pretty interesting for me, but also shocking. Um, and I'm not going to talk about too much uh, whether, what the why they do it, because it's probably 
over grooming or social hair plucking and whether it's really abnormal behavior or it's, or it's the sort of a cost, cultural thing. It's an interesting discussion, but I won't uh, have the time to discuss it here. But for me, it was quite a shock and quite a realization that, that our zoo animals that are also on the internet, they, they sort of a model for, uh, in this case, for uh, designers of uh, stuffed animals. Um, apply this, this line of thinking to our uh, common zoo practices. For example, feeding presentations or uh, feeding in general, bird, bird shows, etc. And just to make sure, I, I don't want to criticize anyone. That's why I also put our own gorilla feeding presentation in the middle of uh, the screen. It's not really about that. It's just uh, because there's a big educational um, role in, in all these types of uh, shows. But I was thinking, well, aren't we, during the shows, aren't we showing just a little bit about the natural behavior uh, repertoire, just like feeding or eating and is it possible, would it be possible to show much more, to show much more how they really are? Um, because what I often realize also during talks and meetings we have at IAS or in our own office, everybody says um, animal welfare is, is so important. We all, we all agree, right? Um, but the reality is that in practice, not every zoo is, still, is already adopting the animal welfare assessments. And, and it's been only just a couple of years that we have an animal welfare officer at the ASA office. So, um, and it's not to criticize that either, but it's just, just a fact. So I was wondering, um, why is it? And of course, working on animal welfare, uh, that takes time, um, whether it is working on enrichment or redesigning an enclosure or uh, just doing animal welfare assessments. If you want to do it properly, it takes time. And we all know that time is money. And I don't know if you heard, uh, watched the uh, Simon Tong yesterday about about how it happened with the uh, closing the living coast. So it's really it made really clear that money, especially in these times, is really a, um, uh, an issue. Um, so for me, what made it really clear is um, I think it really depends on the way we talk about it. So. For me, animal welfare is not a distinct part of the way we operate in zoos, but it's an integral part. And if you Google, for example, uh, the four pillars of modern zoos, which are common, common used, is like education, conservation, research, and recreation. It's pretty interesting, by the way, that if you Google it, there's no picture whatsoever that, um, uh, that shows this. So this is my really um, impressive graphic design of it. And of course, sustainability is there as well. Um, we try to act in a sustainable way. But for me, these four pillars that are the, the center of our zoos are based on a sort of fundamental animal welfare uh, ground. So everything we do has to do with animal welfare, whether it's education, whether it's conservation, whether it's research or recreation. Um, uh, so just to give you some short examples, um, I really, really like the new EASA, uh, EASA population management system, and especially because we're now really assigning roles to, to all the EEPs. Sometimes it's multiple roles, um, and one, for example, is the insurance population. I think that's really uh, important. And uh, to add to that, um, I think most of you have read the Living Planet report recently, which is about uh, which the WWF published it in uh, cooperation with ZSL, and they show that all species have faced a 68% decline since the 70s, which is quite shocking. And of course, it would be much greater without conservation, just to add a positive note. But for me, it really tells me that um, it's really important what we do, and we should continue to do it. But obviously, if we have an insurance population, so we have to make sure that these animals show uh, uh, as much as natural behavior as possible, but they're still uh, white animals um, for, as much, for as, uh, yeah, as much as possible. And of course, also from a research perspective, we would like to have, have normal animals with a normal behavioral repertoire. We have to house them in appropriate facilities and of course in a national group uh, composition where possible. So all these relate to animal welfare for me. Um, so uh, last year, talking about nature, um, I think it was last year, I, I heard a very interesting talk from Jake Fisi, um, which was about the, all the different steps that are part of uh, the natural behavior of a tiger from the, the moment he gets up and uh, starts looking for prey until the actual kill. Um, 
it was really uh, interesting and, and to see how complex it was. And um, this was mainly brought from an animal perspective, but I was thinking, well, because I've also been an, an educator, well, how cool would it be for visitors to see all these, ty these different types of behavior? How, what must it do with the visitors also from an educational perspective, but also just from an experience, how would they talk about it? So even if it's from an animal welfare perspective, it has much more uh, implications for, um, uh, I think also for our visitors. Um, so we also, did something similar more or less in Apenel, um, where we designed a new enclosure and one of the we had two challenges actually so one was how can we stimulate our local biodiversity and the second one is how can we stimulate natural foraging behavior because in the wild primates they, they forage about eight to twelve hours a day and in zoos they we we increase the number of feedings but still it's limited to four to six times a day uh, maybe so we wanted to to create an enclosure where they could could really force themselves and because as you know what, what what do visitors would like to see it's usually it's feeding i don't know why but they want to see animals that are eating um so of course for visitors it's really nice but also for our, for our animals because they um they can show as much natural behavior as possible and still they're primates they're opportunistic so it's not that they forage eight hours a day now but we really see the behavior and it's really People are really liking it, and also from an animal welfare perspective, it's really nice. So, um, yeah, and you, you can see my really beautiful Photoshop. Um, we we also we didn't only build an insect wall, uh, which was about 100 meters long, but also uh, made a lot of um, uh, trees, flowers, shrubs, everything that insects need to eat, and also for our primates. So um, another interesting talk uh, this Tuesday was from Chris Walter from the WCS and um, I can highly recommend it so if you haven't seen it go and, uh, and uh, look it look it up but he also mentioned that our con conventional way of zoo designing is really about uh, you got the animals over there and you got um, people over here and there's a really clear boundary and he, he said one of his main points was uh, it was about the whole COVID crisis that there is still there's a huge gap between animals and humans and we should try and educate our people that we are not above nature but we are part of it and that can also be possible by, by designing enclosure for example which i really liked uh, because that's also the philosophy we have in apple we would like to have visitors be part of the enclosure of the animals so the, the majority of our animals are free roaming and people are guests in their outdoor enclosure um, but on the other hand and that's why i call it the, the paradox is we also encounter um, a pan pandemic, and which is largely due to the fact that the nature of or animals and people are, are um, more in contact with each other. So on one hand, we'd like to bring people more in contact with nature, and on the other hand, we would like them, uh, we would like to increase the distance. So for me, the, the central question was, how can we connect people more to nature in order to realize that we are part of it and not above it, while maintaining a healthy distance? Um, and for me, this really comes down to taking responsibility, and I would like to use uh, gorillas as a sort of a silverback metaphor. Because if you are a gorilla silverback, you are 200 kilos, you are strong, you, you are stronger than the females or the, the juveniles in the group, but with this strength comes a great responsibility. And I think the same is true for people. We have unique, extraordinary uh, qualities that allow us to conquer the whole world, the whole world and destroy it as well. Um, so we also have this responsibility and we should take it because what happens when a gorilla silverback is not taking good care of his, uh, his group, the females, this is a male, but you get the picture, they start to revolt, uh, especially if they look like this, which is the Leela, um, um, they will definitely revolt and eventually they will leave him. So um, for me, that's the same true in nature. We are currently, uh, we are destroying the world to make it really big um, and the nature is already revolting so we see a pandemic we see climate change we see all sorts of stuff going on and i think we are really we really i'd really like the message from chris that we are we should realize that we are part of it and we should take care of nature instead of uh, of leaving it so and now we come back to zoos again i think we we have a sort of a similar metaphor for zoos we take keeping animals in captivity for me is a huge responsibility 
uh, they don't ask, they can talk, they, they didn't choose uh, to be in there. Um, so we have a great responsibility in, in keeping them in the best way possible. And I really think that just trusting our gut feeling and, see, and saying, oh, they're doing okay. Um, uh, so they're probably good. It's not good any, anymore. We have to do all the, the welfare assessments. There's a lot of assistance from the ASA office, from the Animal, for, Animal Welcome, Welfare Working Group. So we really, not, we really need to start doing it from my perspective. And again, I understand it takes time but also performance interviews or maintenance. It all takes time and costs money. So we, we should stop, look at it as, some, as a distinct part of what we do, but we have to see it as an integral part. We should adopt it in all, in every vein of, of, uh, of the zoo. Um, okay, just got one more minute to wrap up. Um, I assume that the majority of you are listening are also at home. So it's not anymore a take home message, but a at home message. So. Like I said, keeping animals is a huge responsibility and so is their welfare. It's not a distinct part, but we should, should use it as an integral part in every, every aspect that we're doing. And for me, it's not, you, it depends really on how you approach it. So if you see it as a cost, yeah, then it's difficult to, to apply, especially in these times. But you can also see it as an opportunity or a benefit and then it totally changes how you can uh, uh, apply it. And just to, to, to close, um, it really enhances our impact and it helps us to reach our goals. We all have a mission. We all we are all standing for nature. We'd like to protect nature. Uh, we'd like to boost biodiversity, etc. And it starts with our own animals and it starts with animal welfare in my perspective. So I hope I've really convinced you. Um, if not, that's really a pity for me. Um, but then please do it for your kids or your nephews or whoever and avoid that they also that they all receive these ugly, weird looking um, uh, bonobo stuffed animals. So um, I'd like to thank you for your information. And I just wanna quickly say hi to my mom. Hi mom, and thanks again for this opportunity. Thank you very much, Thomas, and really great Welcome. to hear from a zoological manager to think about how we can integrate welfare assessments and welfare as you say, into our day-to-day -day work, particularly thinking forward of how we work with our zoos and also in wider fields as well. So thank you very much again, Thomas. And that leads us really well into our next talk by Sally Sherwin, who is the Director of Welfare Conservation and Science at Zoos Victoria. And Sally's going to talk to us about getting teams on board with animal welfare assessments, trying to embed this into training and their attitudes to try and get investment from your staff. So thank you very much, over to you, Sally. Thank you. And I would just like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land and which I'm speaking to you guys from. That's the Wandering people of the Kulin Nation and pay respects to their elders past, present and emerging. And this little snapshot talk that I'm going to have a chat to you guys about today um, actually leads really nicely from what Thomas was, was just saying. So I'm gonna focus um, less on the detail of the assessments and, and more on the, the staff element in integrating this. And bear with me. I always like to start talking about animal welfare with um, this, I just think is, is so relevant to the field of animal welfare, science in particular, from Martin Luther King Jr. So as a genuine leader is not a search of a consensus, but a molder of consensus. And this is so important for zoos, particularly in, in the evolution we're seeing in animal welfare. We, we don't wanna be known for just meeting community expectations or responding to community expectations. We are the experts in zoo animal care and welfare and wellness and, and a focus on um, conservation and wildlife welfare as well. So we really need to be leading these discussions and setting the consensus and, and, and the, the structure and what we think is right for the animals in our care and the animals outside of our care as well. And so this then, I think really highlights the point that animal welfare is not something that zoos should do. Animal welfare is something that zoos need to live and breathe as part of what we do. It needs to become part of our what runs through our blood as, as organisations that care for animals in zoos and in the wild. 
And so this means philosophically that we need to put animals first and, I mean, have that philosophy in our organisations, but also practise that and make sure our decision-making reflects an animal-centric philosophy. And this means having proactive and not reactive strategies. So leadership in this space and setting the standards, not following the standards. Um, key, key element to this as well is having all staff buy-in and, and allowing them to develop a deep understanding that learning experience so that everyone feels comfortable to talk openly and, and transparently about animal welfare in zoos. And not just the zookeepers and the vets um, and the animal care staff, but this is really important for every single person that works at the organisation to be armed with the right information, to be able to talk openly. And so a part of this is really upskilling every single person that works at the organisation in animal welfare, so they're confident in this. And this allows us to be advocates, not only for animal welfare within zoos, but beyond our walls for the wildlife that we're working for in our communities as well. So there's a moral obligation to this because we've got animals in our care and in captivity. And I should flag these, these are some of our incredibly amazing local threatened species. So I'll just point out some of them you might be interested. This is the orange belly parrot. So these are all um, locally, um, so in, in Victoria here in Australia, critically endangered species that are on the brink that we're, we're working for. So we have a moral obligation. But it's also actually a really great business model. And now more than ever, this is so important to acknowledge. And there's some really good science booming in this area around the psychology of, of donors and, and particularly the millennial gen generation and what organisations they want to support. And this has been referred to as um, effective ultra. So it's the next generation of donors. And there was a paper published earlier this year in, in Trends in Ecology and Evolution that this group of, or this generation of donors want to maximise the good per dollar. And they focus on evidence-based giving and a key trigger for their, for their donation behaviour is empathy. They want to feel connected to individual animals and causes. So when we're thinking about welfare strategy, this, what's on, what's on the screen now, that's a really good start. And this is where we started as, as an organisation. You have all these different elements that contribute to a really neat strategy. And that's, you know, incorporating training, enrichment, assessments and science, veterinary care and nutrition and env right environment. But what's, what started to become more and more obvious is that what is a much more effective model is this, and that's the integration of all of these elements into one. And so we call this the, the reimagined welfare strategy where we recognize the value they have as a collective rather than independently. But really key to this, like what Thomas was saying, underpinning is welfare assessment or a benchmarking process. Because this gives you some, some numbers to work towards and some strategies and it can help shift the culture and the, and the organization. So just a quick bit of background on the, the assessment process I'm going to be referring to in, in the examples of what I'll, I'll talk about in terms of the welfare assessment tool, just quickly as a little lead beat as possum. Um, so the various levels of welfare assessment um, are, you know, all, all the way from the broadest level, the bottom of the pyramid there is industry benchmarking. And in our region, um, the Australian and New Zealand ZAA Association, um, we have a really great welfare-based accreditation system and this is that industry at level assessment that's based on welfare. Then you've got your institutional assessment and that, that can be an assessment that's done at your um, entire zoo population level. You can do then welfare assessments on the group of animals or enclosure um, collection of animals and then the individual animal. And these are much more detailed, often a lot more accurate in in-depth information about the individuals, um, whereas that lower end of the pyramids, um, typically more of a risk assessment and, and incorporates a series of, of metrics that can be used. And that can then allow you to hone in on those areas of prioritisation. So the, the process I'm talking about for today and how we've, we've developed staff programs, to culture change and training programs from, is this level, this institutional or zoo level, assessment. And I won't go into details about the methodology of it. It is one of the, um, it's in the Yaza library. Um, there's also, it's an published in Open Access Animals Journal. Um, there's a reference there just in that box. And um, it's based on the five domains. So it's something David Bella 
um, Naya Beausoleil and I, we worked on um, in developing and refining over um, multiple iterations of the process. So that's, that's actually a key point to this though, in terms of integrating um, really key staff training and, and cultural change in animal welfare in the organisation, you need to be open to shifting goalposts. And these can be quite hard to get your head around, but we do want to focus on that. We're always going to be striving for more. We need to do better by the animals. We, we want to shift the standards and increase each year. And so to allow this to happen, we evolve our tool. And that means, yes, we're, you know, it's, it's hard scientifically to get your head around that because it does mess a bit with your data set. But at the end of the day, we're here not for a neat data set. We're here to ensure that the animal's welfare is um, optimised. So, so key elements behind this, again, being open to evolving your tool and your thinking and your processes, shifting those goalposts, but allowing a breadth of indicators so the more focused your welfare is, probably the more, more accurate you'll get of individual animal assessments. But if you broaden out the indicators, you'll start also being able to consider other parts of the organisation that might be interacting with, with different elements of, of the welfare conditions for the animals. So, so consider right across the, the domains of animal welfare, and we've already spoken about this um, in some previous talks tonight or today for the rest of you guys. Um, we also want to incorporate a, a means of highlighting gaps in our understanding. And this part's really important. I'll, go, I'll give a few examples of this um, in a minute, but incorporating an unknown assessment option. So not necessarily making a judgment on a welfare outcome, but going, actually, we don't have enough information right now to be able to accurately assess that. So we call that an unknown assessment. And we'll talk about that a bit more in a minute. We also want to be inclusive and consider including staff, even as observers, that have to actively contribute from a range of non-animal departments. So it becomes, again, a whole of organisation business discussion and that we're talking openly again and, and educating. These conversations are actually an education process in itself because they allow, they allow staff to, to, be, to be part of and engaged in animal welfare discussions that are led by experts in welfare assessment. We want to incorporate clear metrics so that we've got numbers to strive towards and then you use these to set as annual targets that you strive for. So key performance indicators is what I mean by KPIs there. But then strategically, we also need to slot these in to everyone in the organisation's KPIs as, as an individual staff member. You should all be contributing to delivering positive welfare outcomes including and then especially in brackets the zoo directors so we need to have everyone needs to be accountable and responsible across the whole organization to delivering positive animal welfare and that with i think without that you're you're going to be challenged to try and get that whole organization buy-in um, and then critical to all of this is empowering staff to problem solve so welfare assessment shouldn't just be um, or a tool to do welfare assessment it shouldn't just be capturing information and, and monitoring targets and changes. You actually want to then use that information for positive outcomes for the animals. And you, you need to empower your staff to allow that to happen. So give them the tools, the thinking space, the time to problem solve and to make the change themselves. So I'm going to run through a few examples and honing in in, particularly, in, in particular on that um, one of those key points there, which is about that um, incorporating highlighting gaps in our understanding and this unknown assessment option because this really fosters curiosity and curiosity can lead to absolute breakthroughs in how we how we conceptualize and how we work towards animal welfare so a quick example of how we've done this as as part of our results reporting of our annual assessment each year we analyze the frequency and any trends associated with these unknown scores so this highlights the areas that we need to do a bit more research into and, and spend a bit more time doing a deep dive. Highlights our knowledge gaps. So this has led to a research boom, we're calling, in the um, last couple of years since introducing this, we've, we've had 35 research projects specifically in response to these unknown assessments. Some of, the, some of the programs we give to university partners who have students that might be interested in that same topic and that works well as a collaborative exercise. We can support local university students as part of it. But what we think the most valuable 
outcome is that we, we've set up a process that uh, involves staff fellowships. So these are almost like mini scholarships um, that we, we, again, it's that it comes back to staff empowerment in animal welfare problem solving and their research placement. So we, we backfill um, through these scholarship programs, time for the keepers to be taken off the tools. So I should say keepers, vets, um, visitor staff, anyone who's interested in a particular topic and passionate about it for a short period of time and they come and work in the science department, develop the problem solving methodology, lead research and then implement the, the solutions. That, that's the, pretty much the key criteria, the implementation of something. And it might fail, we might not get the right answer, but they, they need to go through that learning process and, and come, come up with, you know, that in itself is, is a learning outcome. And so here's a few examples of that and what's happened over the last couple of years. This is, again, a little um, Leadbeater's possum, who was one of the little guys on the previous slide. Um, the keepers wanted to build up certain muscle, um, muscle areas of this little, these little guys so that they would be better able to forage and move around um, and potentially releasable. And so they built specially designed structures to focus in on the muscles that they wanted built to build up their foraging abilities. So this is called a little jungle gym. They designed it, they set it up and they evaluated it from an animal outcome point of view. So lots of fun also to, um, to sit and watch these guys in interacting in their gym as well. A similar study or approach from the threatened species keepers um, is studying breeding behavior of the helmeted honey eater, another critically endangered species, and um, set up remote cameras so we could get information on, on parental care in these guys. And from this, we've, um, we've seen some really incredible behaviors, and we're about to see one here. It's a unique take on um, incubation behavior, this little, this little bird, but um, you can see it doesn't, it's not that comfortable, moves around, but, and the keepers um, observe these animals, write them up and integrate it again into management. We then had some questions around uh, what, what kind of enrichment or, um, or human interaction or food preferences do tortoises have? And how do we try and understand their, their motivation, their preference? So we set up a little tortoise uh, three-arm maze to, to run various preference tests on that. And we had some fascinating, um, in, interesting examples out of that from individual tortoise differences. Um, so, like I said, this is an inclusive program. We've got a lot of vets at the moment working in this space with us um, because of what what we went through in the in the past summer with the bushfires here that had a devastating impact on our native wildlife. And we were we were the responders here in Victoria on behalf of the wildlife treating treating injured animals like these these koalas you can see here and as a result of that we've vowed to learn from it and do better for the next fire season so so a few of our vets are now working um, full-time in research fellowships understanding the case the cases and the learnings from treating these animals and incorporating that into protocols for future work that can happen we also do some strategic organisational projects that are less research based and more about organisational policies and, and strategies. And one that's been a, um, that we've had multiple different projects on is the human animal discussion and how, how do we run ethical animal experiences. And so we had, um, we had a keeper and visitor staff work with us analysing the literature that's out there and, and summarising it, running some um, basic preliminary studies and then using that information to come up with some, some science-based guidelines for how we want to run these kind of experience and connect people with these animals, but doing it in a way that is about the animal, not about the human. It's all about the animal in this. And then we recognised a gap in our welfare standards. We went we don't seem to have the same approach for managing welfare of, of the reptiles as we do a lot of the other animals in our care. So we thought we better, um, we better get to the bottom of that. And we had our welfare, some of our welfare team work on developing reptile welfare guidelines and now implementing them as part of, as part of this continuous improvement process. So there are a couple of examples of these strategic projects that we've led at, off the back of using this welfare assessment tool as the foundation of, of this work. 
And then when we have comments or feedback from the staff like this, that that reflection that it's more, this is more than the animals we work for and having that tunnel vision focus on the animal is important. But this, this approach allows people to have more of a helicopter view and um, recognise that the work we do carries such a responsibility on behalf of the community that support us and then how we deliver on the promise that we have to, to save these animals and to, and to safeguard their welfare and, and much bigger than, um, you know, than just what we think of the day-to-day -day work. And that's, that's so powerful. So that's, that's a high level summary from me. And, um, and we've just started doing a lot more um, staff internal training on this and we evaluate knowledge gaps and then areas and, and have created some online modules and so we're starting now to to see if other zoos want to um, be involved in this as well so we're, we're starting to dabble in this area so um, have a browse on this this site and reach out if you have any any questions for what we can do there and we do evaluations we've just finished one of these workshops and um, and the results are pretty incredible. So at the end of this, we, uh, our welfare assessment approach, we had people right back with having a, a really strong understanding of, of how to integrate these kind of welfare assessments. So that's it from me and happy to take um, questions over email at the end of the, the session. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sally. It's a fantastic talk and it's so great to be integrating your keepers and other members of staff into actual evidence-based welfare. I think it's an incredible thing and it looks a really exciting um, plan in terms of getting people involved through training workshops, that's great. So I have our last speaker now. I'd like to introduce Katerina Spizio, who is the Head of Research and Conservation and Curator of Animal Behaviour and Welfare at Parco Natura Viva in Italy. And she'll be giving us a step-by-step -step guide to starting an animal welfare assessment program at your collection. So Katerina, would you like to share your screen, please? I'm sorry, I'm trying to do, but uh, it seems okay now. I, I don't know if it's this one or not. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So uh, I have just to open the video. Okay. Now it's fine. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? I hope so. Um, it's not too simple uh, to uh, start uh, and to give uh, this talk now. After this great talk, we had the possibility to uh, listen this afternoon. However, I will try to say, uh, to give you some new information, but also to summarize uh, what we already um, have heard this afternoon. So the idea is uh, to uh, follow a step-by-step -step guide to starting uh, your animal welfare assessment program. Is not moving. Oh, sorry. Okay, now it's moving. Thank you. And um, okay, I can. Yes, thank you. I have also a technician here with me, but. And uh, the idea is uh, uh, to uh, start from step by step uh, and uh, to take care of our animal and uh, the uh, animal welfare assessment. So the first step, uh, as we already heard about, is to decide what you want to achieve from uh, your assessment. Uh, we are, uh, would like to assess the whole zoological collection, an enclosure, a single animal. In any case, animal welfare can differ between individuals uh, at the, at, that belong at the same species and also at the same group, even when they are exposed to the same condition. So in the case of zoos, animals often came from heterogeneous backgrounds with different previous life experience that can influence their ability to cope with certain challenges. And there are also some species specific characteristics that can evolve to enable animals to cope with the different environments. It does 
should also consider welfare at the species, such as species level adaptation could be related to dietary needs, hearing sensitivity, thermoregulatory needs, and so on. In the case of zoos, again, animals belong to different species with different needs and adaptation. The second step would be to do uh, for run a good assessment template uh, is to choose an assessment template, adapt the template and design or design a new one. Understanding the natural species biology and hence the physical and physiological needs of the animals is not so simple because we need to think about that individuals have different personalities and preferences. However, we can find the Good Animal Welfare Assessment Library in, on the other website where there are useful, useful um, examples of template for animal welfare assessment. I cannot move anymore my presentation. I don't know why. I'm stuck on the slide. You can try exiting your PowerPoint and resharing again. Yeah. If that doesn't Sorry. work with the bar, the space bar or the arrows. Oh, oh yes. Okay, okay. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> And um, when we think about uh, the um, animal welfare assessment, uh, as we already heard, we need to, uh, to choose the welfare indicators. So um, if uh, we think about uh, an animal uh, and we can say that the animal acts and reacts in the environment, uh, and this is a meaningful tool, the behavior alone does not always give any comprehensive insight in the animal welfare, but the animal's behavior often gives important information about the single individual. Okay, we'll go on with this. Through behaviors, an animal is communicating feelings and emotion. Thus, the behavior can be a good indicator of welfare, but behavior indicators of welfare need to be validated and uh, interpreted carefully because uh, we have, as we already said, different species and also different individuals. And there is another aspect that we need to take in, into consideration when we talk about behavior. And uh, is uh, a different um, categorization of behavior, natural, normal, and natural abnormal. Natural behavior is a typical observed in the wild, whereas abnormal behavior usually you cannot see in the wild. And then you have normal and unnatural behavior. Normal behavior is maybe natural or unnatural, but makes sense within the context in which it is performed. And the natural behavior may be normal or abnormal, but it is not typical observed in the wild. For example, if you can see this behavior, this behavior could be a behavior that uh, you normally don't see in the wild because uh, the chimpanzees did not use uh, straw in the wild to uh, drink uh, from uh, uh, the juice from uh, a oil, but is uh, a very important behavior and uh, is uh, a behavior that we can consider a behavior, a positive behavior of these. Uh, of the chimpanzees uh, in this colony. Usually they use the stick uh, for termite fishing, but in this case, uh, there is some juice, fresh juice, and uh, they use the straw to drink from this, uh, this oil. Again, this in, uh, in opposite, this is a natural behavior. They use a tool to just uh, take some food uh, from seeds and uh, so on. So they use a piece of wood as a tool uh, to, um, to get food. Another, another very important aspect after choosing the uh, indicator, the welfare indicator, is to, to choose the methodology to collect the welfare indicators for the assessment. So to suggest methodologies in the assessment of good rather than acceptable welfare and developing indicators to address positive welfare of each zoo individual have been increasingly important in animal welfare science. And uh, the historically um, non-human zoo animal welfare has been driven from knowledge from farm animal welfare science, considering mind, body, nature, and animals. And in zoos, animal welfare is studied as a measure of behavior, behavior flexibility, and also physiology and uh, still focus on the behavior, the variety of behaviors performed by each individual could be used as a welfare indicator since behavior variety could be lost during a challenging situation that could characterize controlled environments. 
after the indicators and the methodology, we need also to choose a team who will be able to coordinate the assessment project, process, process. And it could be a researchers, curator, keepers, educators, is a staff member that can coordinate the entire process, but it's not enough because we need also a team that is able to collect data for the assessment of the process. So uh, researchers, keepers, students, as we already heard, there are university really interested in doing this kind of uh, research and assessment, research regarding assessment of animal welfare. So a student could be a useful uh, um, instrument for uh, uh, doing some data collection. And uh, very important also is a design an assessment protocol for the teams to follow because it's very important to say when, what, how, and who uh, need to collect the behavioral data. At the end, um, the last step is uh, um, when you finish your assessment, what do you do with your results? And uh, could be a report for internal discussion, a document useful for a decision making process, a document for best practice guideline for a species, or a paper to be published in a scientific journal as uh, JZAR. So it's very important to uh, have in mind this uh, ideal different step about uh, um, developing an assessment project pro pro program. Now I just would like to give an example by, of a step-by-step -step process and uh, this is uh, focused on behavior. So it's not, as we already heard about, it's very important to uh, put together all uh, the indicators that we need for uh, assess animal welfare, but we have many species, we have many animals in our zoo and it's important also to find a solution to be able to uh, get information of our animals uh, um, uh, several times per year, or at least once per year for each individual. In any case, this is a, a sort of behavior variety index to assess zoo animal welfare. And first of all, we said that we needed to think about uh, what, why we have, uh, why we want to do a welfare assessment. And the aim of this study was to investigate the behavior of Northern wild ibis at different ages. Why? Because there was a, a, um, an introduction project of the juveniles and we would like to see, uh, to check if their behavior is uh, uh, good enough to um, give them the opportunity to survive in the wild. To maintain a broad natural behavior repertoire across generation of animals with their introduction purposes is a very important behavior management and conservation. Basing on data collected through continuous recording animal behavior, a method used in human literature to identify agent behavior was a review to propose this sort of behavior variety index. When you are, um, find, when you are trying to find in literature something interesting for um, doing a behavioral um, welfare assessment, it is very important also to find uh, something within humans, because the study on uh, animal welfare, quality of life, uh, uh, sorry, um, human welfare, quality of life, uh, they are also well done in, uh, in uh, human uh, literature. So this study was a simple index to measure hygiene behavior and it was published in 2006 uh, by Webb and colleagues. They based their methodology on spot checks. is a very um, a new method for, uh, for us to check is not uh, all occurrences, uh, not uh, continuous recording, uh, is something new, but it's a popular method to assess uh, hygiene behaviors uh, in uh, humans. So the study evaluated the within household repeatability of hygiene indices created from spot check and their ability to have uh, incidence on uh, diarrhea in uh, young Guatemalan children. So these uh, uh, hygiene behaviors was uh, um, collected on over uh, on less than 600 households in four rural Guatemalan communities over, 30, over three years. And uh, four indices were created, uh, drinking water related to drinking water, food, personal hygiene, domestic household hygiene, and uh, there was uh, a summary hygiene index uh, created by these uh, uh, indices. Uh, the methodologies was uh, uh, to compare the continuous focal animal sampling method, a very, um, a very strong method of, to collect behavioral data, but also uh, very um, uh, demanding as method and uh, spot check that uh, could be 
um, rapid and easy standardized alternative structure behaviors, observations. Um, this method provides in time saving and economic alternative to structure observation and also spot check can be repeated during the year and can be used for several species. The only problem is to have a very good list of specific, uh, species specific natural behavior because uh, um, you need to start from the behavior that the species has, uh, the species has in, uh, in the wild. And uh, even if uh, sometimes in literature it's not so simple to find an ethogram of the species, uh, it's very important to compare other studies uh, related to other species. But the list of species specific natural behavior is very important for uh, this study for the assessment of these uh, um, behavioral index. Uh, so following the same procedure that uh, the study did for humans, uh, we use the same procedure. So four groups of behavior, we consider routine behavior, exploration, comfort, social behavior, and uh, we calculated at the end the behavioral index of each group. So for each index was calculated, each index was calcul calculated for each individual, a behavioral variety index was calculated for each subject and resulted from the sum of the four indices. The indices score range from zero to the total number of behavioral items found for each group. And uh, basing on the previous literature on species behavior, etogram could be um, possible to have this behavior variety index that could be a measure for a variety of positive behavior of the animal in a controlled environment. Uh, the graph that you can see on the left uh, is uh, related to the, uh, the study in humans, the right is related to our study. And uh, you have uh, the, uh, num the percentage of the subject that uh, perform all the uh, behavior within each category, each, in each group. For example, in the routine behavior, you have, you have all uh, the uh, subjects that perform the five uh, um, um, behaviors that are in routine behavior. This is just an example about this. And uh, at the end, the results um, were published in a paper, but why it's important to publish the result in a paper because they can be widespread and they can be used uh, for the zoo community because it's very important to have an idea of uh, the welfare of our animals. So in this case, uh, the, the, um, uh, our idea, the, our aim is to suggest that the behavior variety in this may, might help in the evaluation of the variety of behavior performed by each individual and monitor the diversity of the behavior re repertoire of zoo animals. It's time consuming because we need really to have a very good um, ethogram of the species, but uh, this, uh, um, this method is, could help in, um, in assessing animal welfare of our, uh, our uh, zoo animals. So summarizing uh, what all the, the talk of today already say about, uh, um, the step-to-step -step guide could be um, made by a first decision related to what to achieve from our assessment. The second step could be to choose the assessment template, uh, for example, now from the Ad Animal Welfare uh, Library, but also very important on the welfare indicators and methodologies to collect the data. Welfare indicator as much as possible, but if we have a specific um, need, we can use just uh, some indicators. Then you have to choose a team to coordinate uh, your assessment template and a team to collect data. And very important is the design of an assessment protocol for the teams to follow because we need, uh, as a part of the team, or the team need to know when and how and who uh, to collect the, the, the data. And at the end of the story, there is uh, the important uh, information about the results. So decide what do you want to do with the results, so to use them internally or to spread your information uh, around the zoo community because it's very important to know something about the uh, animal welfare assessment. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. Sorry, I can do... Thank you. Uh, can you please unshare your screen? Yeah, I will try. Thank you very much for giving your talk. It's great to, to get an idea about how we can actually start approaching integrating welfare assessments. Thanks. 
So I would just like to say a big thank you to all of our speakers for our plenary session. It's been fantastic. And I'm really looking forward to the webinar series to hear the extended talks. I think it's been a great introduction to starting welfare assessments or hopefully has given you some ideas of how you can improve and even think about add-ons to your welfare assessments in the future if you're already using them. I think Sally wants to jump on and just say a few words um, to close. Yeah, just a, to echo Holly's words, a big thank you to all of our speakers for their fantastic thought, uh, thoughts and sharing their expertise with us. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you to Holly for your seamless chairing. And thank you to also to our ERs executive office team, uh, David Williams Mitchell, Mirko Marseille and Sanjeev Kames that have been working behind the scenes during that with regards to IT chat and making sure everything goes smoothly uh, behind the scenes. So a big thank you. To all of you that have submitted questions, thank you very much. We will be collating those. We will hand them to our speakers who hopefully will kindly provide us with the responses and then we'll collate them into one document and share them with everybody that's registered. So everyone will receive all the questions and answers and hopefully there'll be things in there that you'll find interesting and wouldn't have necessarily thought to ask. Please keep an eye on our EASA website, Animal Welfare page, and our EASA Animal Welfare Facebook group. There we will have, um, we'll be sharing the opportunity to register for the Animal Welfare Forum 22, which is in Appenhall, which promises to be brilliant. Um, and you'll be able to register for the webinars that follow these talks. And the, um, those places will be very limited, so please don't miss out on those. Um, on the website, you'll also be able to find our Animal Welfare Assessments Library, the recording of this plenary, and um, also recordings of previous animal welfare webinars that we've conducted, including ones with, for example, Sally Sherwin. So thank you very much. Lastly, a huge thank you to you all for joining us. We hope you enjoyed it, and goodbye. Thank you.